over the years, you know, obviously WSU has had his, uh, his down years, but for the most part, when things are clicking, it's not because you got five, five stars out there. You got some twos, some threes, and some guys that, that believe in, in uh, just being together and in playing for each other. And it's, it's special, man. It's fun to watch too. So um, I think that's what we're seeing right now. And, uh, and they have an opportunity to win a whole bunch of games. But, you know, as coaches say, one day at a time, one game at a time. But we can look ahead. I'm looking ahead and saying, come on now, we can run the table. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Nick and Nigel Show, Week Eight, I believe. Coach, uh, hey man, how you doing out there in uh, Eugene, Oregon, this morning? Well, everybody's very happy, happy, happy here in Eugene. Uh, we'll get to it later after the big win against Ohio State. So uh, I'm doing great. The town was buzzing this weekend, and obviously, a lot of people live vicariously through how their team does and this team here in Eugene did well so everybody's very happy <laughs> well you know what else we are ha- ha- happy to also always be on uh, Samsung TV plus channel 2392 on all Samsung connected TVs also make sure you can find us on Amazon freebie or on YouTube just type in Nick and Nigel also gotta remember who else is happy our partners at Todd Filters Pub at 1501 Northwest Monroe in Corvallis, the place to watch all Beaver games before, during, and after the games. And our friends at MDI Management for exceptional luxury living in the mid Willamette Valley. Uh, I'm glad everybody's happy in Eugene. Everybody in Corvallis is a little sad. Uh, man, the Beavs go on the road to Nevada. And it was the struggle bus, Coach. The struggle bus. As... Uh, the Beavs get handed a 42 to 37 loss to the Wolfpack of Nevada. I can't, I couldn't wrap my head around this one. 353 yards Nevada had on the ground running 8.4 yards per carry coach. Uh, man, uh, the Beaver defense was struggling. I, I look, I don't know if they need to bring in, uh, you know, coach Aliotti, uh, off of retirement. For a little bit of uh, a little bit of you know consulting work, but when you watch this game, what, what were your thoughts about you know how the Beaver D was struggling to to uh, to stop the run? Well, first of all, they were short a few players. I know that, so I'm going to give them a little love on that. But the whole to to give up 350 yards rushing that is a definite recipe for defeat. They weren't in their gaps. They didn't get off blocks. They missed tackles. They gave up the edge of the defense. All of the above. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they just played very bad run defense. And then the quarterback had a great day, also running the ball. But it was just it, it was just a really really bad day stopping the run. And we know Trent Bray has shown and Keith Hayward, very good football coaches. I know, again, I know they were down players, but with their backups, they should be able to beat a Nevada Reno team. So uh, I can't give them a pass. That was a, that was a bad, bad loss. You know, everything was interesting because I was watching. And here's the thing that's crazy to me, Coach. Every time, I mean, I'm watching NFL games. I'm seeing the same exact stuff. Guys don't. It, it, look, I, I got, you know, it's the old Oklahoma drills that we used to have to run, right? That nobody runs anymore in practice. But you've got a blocker in front of you. You have to shed that block and make a tackle, right? And I'm watching more guys, whether I'm talking high school football, college football, the NFL, same thing. Guys just running around blocks and then getting washed to oblivion. When I'm watching, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, a, of the, the, uh, you know, multiple runs, you know, Savion Red, the transfer from Texas that Nevada had, had that six-yard TD run. I mean, he had a couple of short runs. He had a couple of long runs where, you know, you had guys, you know, heck, it, I don't even think it's a coordinator. It can't, well, I know it's not a coordinator issue, but, you know, you you got your X's, they've got their O's. If I've got two X's unblocked at the point of attack 
and they don't make the play, I, I don't know what else to do as a defense coordinator. You know, I'm wondering when you're having these kind of issues, you know, as many years as you were coordinator, what did you do? Did you did you try to calm down movement when you were having those problems, or do you try to move more so guys, you know, end up not having you know having to shed blocks when they're struggling with it? Calm it down. Mm. Line, assign, adjust. Just stay in your gap. Go straight ahead. Give them a chance to not. There's a lot of times when you get caught moving, then the other guy doesn't fill the gap that you move to, and you have to have this one and switching assignments calm it down nigel uh become simpler if it was complex stay in your gap stay straight ahead so everybody knows what gap they're filling including the safeties and the the corners when they have to play on the edge on a motion down to make a tight formation uh that's the bottom line but they they did everything they could do wrong uh stop at the run and when you give up edges of the defense, which they did a number of times, that's really when explosion plays happen and hurt you. Yeah. Well, offensively, uh, it wasn't uh, a whole lot better. Obviously, Anthony Hankerson did his thing, ran for a kajillion yards like he has pretty much in every game. But Javonte McCoy struggled for the first time. Look, the Beavs are really good at not turning the ball over. Four interceptions. Now, one of them was a Hail Mary at the end. But three were pretty critical, including a pick six that really sealed the deal for Nevada. Uh, you know, it was it was interesting to see. He was just a little bit off, a little bit late on some of his throws. Uh, when he threw to his guy, uh, Sauce Walker, a.k.a. Trent Walker, uh, on an out route, you know, got a pick that he gave up there as the Beavs were trying to get in the scoring position and all these different things. And so, again, the Beavs uh, do everything they can to try to come out with a win. But unfortunately, struggle and lose at Nevada. And it doesn't get any easier because they take on the other team from Nevada, UNLV, who right now is playing maybe the best ball in the history of their program. We're ranked in the top 25 for the first time, just beat Utah State on the road 50 to 34. Their only loss at Syracuse in overtime 44 to 41. By the way, here's UNLV. It ain't any easier for the Beaver defense. Last three scores UNLV's had. 59 against Fresno offensively. They've scored 59 against Fresno. They scored 72 against Utah Tech. They scored 41 in a loss to Syracuse and 50 last week against the Aggies of Utah State. So it ain't going to get any easier uh, for the Beaver defense. Uh, hey, shift the gears over to our boys in Pullman who take on Hawaii this weekend. Uh, the John Mateer show continues as he continues to do what he does. You had... The defense, I loved it, as they come out with a win 25-17 on the road at Fresno. You and I talked about how tough it is to come out of Fresno with a win. You better bring the big sticks, and the Cougs did just that, Coach. That was a good football game. And and in my opinion, that was the best Washington State has played defensively. They were stout, got a great win uh, in Fresno in the Valley. Uh, They were tough. They tackled well. They score on a on a pick six actually to win the game, Ethan O'Connor. And on the offensive side, I mean, I wonder what this team would be like offensively without John Matier. Because <laughs> he didn't have his greatest game. Right. He threw for about 50% completion rate, but he extended <laughs> plays with his legs. He kept his eye down the field, got some receivers late, made some critical first downs on some runs. John Matier. Uh, although I didn't think he might have been his worst game, believe it or not, might have been his worst game, but it still was a good game. And Mateer, wow, he's really making that offense click. But the defense really stepped up and got him the win. It was fun to watch. They're just a fun team to watch, especially when they play that type of defense. So I, I don't know what's going on. I may, Somebody's calling saying it's time to move on and uh, get with our guy, Michael Bumpus. So, hey, coming up next, we're going to talk a little more Wazoo football. Bumpus calling right now. And he's like, look, I'm tired of this, man. Let's go. I want to talk Wazoo football. Coming up next on Nick and Nigel. Welcome back to the second segment of Nick and Nigel. Once again, uh, brought to you by Claude Filters Pub, Inc. for Vallis and MDI Management for Exceptional Luxury Apartment Living in the Mid Willamette Valley. Uh, gotta get to my guy, 
I'm going to go ahead and say it. The greatest, the greatest receiver <laughs> in Washington State history, Michael Bumpus, joins us on the Nick and Nigel Show. Bump, what's good, my guy? Hey, thanks for the gas. They should have drafted me then, man. What's <laughs> wait so long for? <laughs> what would this team be this year without John Mateer? Mm. That dude, I don't know if the only – you know, thing, the only issue he has is if Kryptonite makes his way onto the field. This dude, like I was thinking about, who is he like? I think the reason he's so captivating right now, especially for Washington State fans, is because he's so different than what we've seen, right? Yeah. He's not like Alex and Ryan and those tall pocket passers. But, you know, Gesser would leave the would leave the pocket and take off running, but he's not the same because I don't ever remember Gesser running you over. Uh, you know, guess who might be able to run you over now? The dude looks like he bench pressing <laughs> five pounds, but not not back then. Material run you over. I mean, is there anybody you remember that he reminds you of? Man, it's crazy because he, he's following Cam Ward, and people thought Cam was a running quarterback. Nah, he was just mobile. Like he buys some time, but he wants to throw the rock. You know what's crazy? He reminds me of a guy who wore your colors, man, Jake Locker. Honestly, um, Jake, I think, was a little bigger. And I think uh, Mateer maybe has a um, better touch on the football. But you talk about athletic dudes who can just take it off. Yeah, he reminded me of Jake Locker. When Jake had the football when we played them, whenever he decided to take off, I just held my breath. I'm like, goodness gracious, he can take this thing all the way. I, I would assume that's how some people feel when Mateer is playing. And I think they wore the same number. Jake wore 10 too, right? Yeah. No, nope. you're absolutely right. right. So, yeah. yeah, I got I got to go to your neck of the woods, but... Uh, without Matera, this team ain't, ain't winning ball games. I mean, he's the leading rusher on the team over 500, uh, five or six touchdowns. He's got, what, 14, 15 through the air. When he's not going, that's when I'm nervous. That's why I was looking at that Fresno State game. I'm like, all right, this is uh, this is going to be rough. And if he's not performing, it, it's always tough. You know, it's funny you said the difference between being mobile and being a runner. Here's the difference for those at home. You're mobile when you leave the pocket. You're a runner when they call quarterback power. <laughs> yeah. when they start pulling guards until you just run downhill you are officially a runner that is that is a that's a different deal um you know it's funny the other thing i noticed about this you know the the, the best part though about this football team right now is if john seems to be off a little bit like there were some moments he still had some unbelievable throws i, I still i still i mentioned the one with tony nelson he you know he scrambled to the right and threw that thing on a howitzer on a line yep. the defense stepped up in this game I mean, your boy Tariq, you had, you know, uh, uh, why am I sp sp uh, spacing right now? I'm with my boy Brown. I mean, you got picks, you had sticks. Them dudes are playing like people owe the money on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, that's that's kind of been a thing for WSU is, you know, what, five and one, and it feels like they've won five different ways. You know, you, you start the season and you throw for 1,000 yards and a bunch of touchdowns. As the season progresses, uh, Mateer wins it with his legs, and then lately – you know, he got that pick six to the house. You know, without that pick, so I, don't, I don't know if, if WSU wins this ball game. So when you're scouting WSU, of course, your main focus on offense is going to be to stop Mateer. But, uh, man, is, is Parker going to go off? You know, we got Kyle Williams on the outside. We're actually using a tight end. I haven't seen a tight end in Wazoo in like 15 years. It's uh, They're finding ways to win. I spoke to Dicker, man, and I remember it was a win. It was a San Jose State win. I text him. I go, hey, man, they're not always pretty. <laughs> But, you know, they build character. He goes, man, wins are always pretty. And I go, you know what? You're exactly right. I don't care how you get it. As long as you got it, you good. Yeah, absolutely right, man. You know you know what's funny is, um, you know, obviously I'm close with Nick. We've gone way back. But you and I, man, like, you know, it's funny. I, I don't know if I should say this because I work with Brian a lot. You know, we play golf and all that stuff. But Bump is by far, he's my favorite coup, man. We talk more trash, have more fun, and talk more life. And we were talking about Washington State football all we want to. But the thing that's been on my mind lately is uh, I was thinking about, so, you know, go go back in time. Our last show on the Pac-12 network, with they're in the studio. We sign off. It wasn't like it wasn't like when I was with Nick and Ashley and I started, you know, breaking out, crying like a little, you know what, on TV. <laughs> but um, we, we were kind of in this mode. And we, we all grabbed beers afterwards and we were sitting there. And I'll never forget something you said. And it, to me, the reason I think it, it resonates is because it's the most Washington State, Oregon State, Pac-12 thing ever. That we, you know, you and I were not the biggest players. We weren't the fastest players. We weren't, you know, a lot of times we weren't always the smartest guys either. <laughs> but 
you, you we've had this ability to manifest our reality based on if we really wanted something bad enough like and i remember you said that to me man and that really that really stuck with me you know and i just think about how this conference has gone how these two schools have been retreated all these different things and have manifested their own reality they have taken charge of their own thing and that's why like listen i'm a husky i ain't gonna act like i'm not but the Cougs and the Bees have always been in my heart because I've always felt like I'm one of those guys, one of those guys who wasn't given things and you had to like grind for them. And so it's just, it's, it's interesting to me, man, is, you know, how <clears throat> not just these schools, but how, you know, your story and how you were able to like manifest this thing out of literally out of nowhere to end up being one of the greatest players and now one of the faces of one of the proudest programs on the West Coast. Yeah, um, I remember that conversation, man. I was, uh, you know, it was always nice when, you connect with with the homies after after work over a beer and and things like that come up and I think um I think that's what we're seeing out of WSU right now I mean they're not the collective don't have a lot of money um it's not like alums are just tossing checks at Jake Dicker but he has a message that I think the guys on the program truly believe you know now as we've seen it we've covered a bunch of teams and talked to players across the country I mean when you have tradition when you have 50, 60, 100 years of tradition of winning bowl games and doing all that, you kind of just show up and fall in line. But when you're um, the Cougs and the Bees, right, you got to lean on each other and take that underdog mentality and use it in life and school, relationships, on the football field. And you got to have the certain type of leader to to help manifest that within your program. And I think that's what Jay Digger did. I think that's what it attracted me to WSU out of high school. And I think that – um over the years, you know, obviously WSU has had his, uh, his down years, but for the most part, when things are clicking, it's not because you got five five stars out there. You got some twos, some threes, and some guys that that believe in in uh, just being together and in playing for each other. And it's it's special, man. It's fun to watch too. So um, I think that's what we're seeing right now. And uh, and they have an opportunity to win a whole bunch of games. But you know, as coaches say, one day at a time, one game at a time. But we can look ahead. I'm looking ahead and saying. Come on now, we can run the table. Well, shoot, man. Well, hey, Buck, it's always great, always great to catch up with you, my guy. Um, looking forward to it. On the call for the CW, Hawaii at Wazoo. Uh, anything you're looking for in this game? Because, look, let's be honest. Hawaii's been struggling. They just had to deal with uh, Ashton Jetty, who I, I actually was like, I, I saw the stats, and I was like, well, he took it easy on him. He only ran for, like, just under $200. I was yeah, like, right. like, okay, like, they did a good job. Uh, what's what are you looking for in this game? Well, I mean, I was on the San Jose um game call and uh, going into the game, I go, well, San Jose State they can't run the football, they're only averaging fifty eight yards per game, and of course they go off for over a hundred, right? So now I'm looking at Hawaii, I go, all right, well, now they're last in the Mountain West when it comes to running the football. You know they want to throw it, they lead the conference in attempts, um, in yards. Their defense on paper, when you look at the numbers, are better than what people think. Uh, so I'm just looking to uh, to make them have to run the football or attempt to run the football. And I think they're going to try because um, obviously the Broncos have been able to do it. They ran on everybody. Uh, but when you see a team like San Jose State that doesn't really have a commitment to run the football, be able to go for over 100, Hawaii has to look at that and say, let's just give it a try. Uh, but they're going to throw the ball across the yard. Um, you need to create some turnovers. If they get busy on the ground, then I'm going to be worried because you know what that's like, man. You get that run game going, everything else opens up. Uh, the the pitcher's painted for their quarterback. And then I just want to see Matera take care of the rock, man. It's been, what, two, three games in a row where he has multiple turnovers, multiple interceptions. Uh, we fumbled the ball a few times. I'm um, talking about the WSU off. And so just be clean. Like, take care of a team that on paper you're supposed to take care of in a fashion that if we were back in the BCS days, will give us some more points from the computer. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, keep it clean. Don't let them run the football on you. And uh, just get some dang turnovers, man. Well, I'm, I appreciate the fact we were able to keep it clean in this interview. Uh, <laughs> hopefully nobody uh, ever uh, broadcast the uh, outtakes, and we'll go from there. But, uh, hey, always a pleasure, my guy. I look forward to seeing you on the call. Stick around. Nick and Nigel.